Hey, welcome to Puffcast. My guest is Jessica Lilly, actor and co-creator of Her Creature, a film 10 years in the making with marvellous results. She shares the meaning and methodology behind her inspiration to create a piece of work that advocates for sufferers of mental health and how the process of creativity is a highly effective form of therapy. Her impressive background studying acting, dance and theatre around Australia comes alive in this film. She shares her zest for the works of Tim Burton and Jim Henson. And we discuss the impact of Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, and much more. Jessica is a bright, multi-talented, proactive and compassionate filmmaker. Respectful human traits for depicting human frailty. Enjoy the conversation and support the channel. Thanks for listening. Catch you on the next one. Ciao for now. Let's go. Hey folks, my guest today is Jessica Lilly and um, she's here to talk about her film, Her Creature. Hey Jess, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, man. That's awesome. Well, before we kick off into the details of the film, how about we learn a bit about who you are and your background? Okay. Um, Well, I... Um, have always been really creative from a young age. I've always loved the arts. I've always loved, um, you know, playing different characters, getting up on stage um, and representing the human condition. That's what I really love about acting, but also filmmaking and telling stories, um, important stories, and hopefully um, making a difference. So in relation to my background, I've studied um, in Broome, Melbourne, Sydney, Perth. I um. Ha- well, I've never yeah. heard of anyone studying in Broome. Yeah. How was that? That was um, phenomenal. Um, I did a year there through WAPA, oh. and um, it was such an amazing experience. Um, in fact, I had one of my huge creative breakthroughs um, in Broome. Um, I was a part of this uh, festival called um, Worn Art, which is um, wearable art. Oh, worn art. Worn art, yeah, it's, okay. it's huge in art room. that is worn. Yes, um, and I got to be a harp, so I got to be a big harp um, amongst this orchestra, and um, I really fell in love with the idea of art and performance mm. and um, thinking outside the box in relation to performance and art. So, yeah, so that was a, a great experience and just an amazing um, cultural experience as well, um, my course in Broome and... Um, yeah, love it there. So yes, and then I went to, um, uh, I did some study in Perth, um, and then I went to um, Melbourne and did a contemporary arts degree, mm. um, which involved a lot of acting, but I was also, again, really fascinated with um, performance art. So I did a unit in um, performance art, and um, I created, I incorporated that into performance. So I created this really cool um, installation. Um, I also have a bit of a background in dance, and I had these dancers mm. come out of these big pot plants. Their legs were the were the pot were the actual um, like plants growing out and okay. things like that. So I'm, I'm quite plants of legs. I'm really into visual aesthetics. Yeah, cool. So really <clears throat> unusual creative visual aesthetics. A surrealism. Or... Yeah, and background in like theatre so I have um, okay. an education so I'm really passionate about um, theatre education and, and mm. um, bringing the arts. Because you teach as well don't you? Yeah. yeah yeah so I'm really passionate about um, I value the arts and I'm and I want to instill that in in children and kids mm. and students and and know that it's really important to express themselves creatively mm. and to feel free to do that and um, to embrace that part of them, that creative element. Um, so I really nurture that and um, mm. um, that's just really exciting to be able to be a part of that process with them. Okay, well let's delve into the synopsis of your film. 
I'll read it out and we can talk about it after. Cool. Yep. Her creature is the story about Olive, a woman with dreams and aspirations, who unexpectedly finds herself struggling with mental illness. That is represented in the form of the creature. Her journey of discovery, acceptance and resolution over this seemingly uncontrollable creature is one of courage, empowerment and strength. It is a didactic story whose primary objective is to educate and confront stigmas associated with mental illness in modern day society. Well, there's a lot going on in there. <laughs> yeah, there is. Do you want to start with, um, so who is Olive? So Olive is the lead character in in her creature. And I really wanted to show this character's struggle with her condition and the isolation that she was experiencing. Um, but also I wanted to show her relationship with this creature who is essentially her condition, her mental illness. <clears throat> So yeah, I wanted to show her her um, all the shades to her, her um, that you know, and that she does have this other part of her that she essentially um, not many people know about. Um, so I wanted to represent it in the form of a creature, which I thought would be quite interesting. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> so not like her demon. No, like... definitely not a demon. Her creature is a. Oh, as yeah. metaphor metaphorically, like we have demons and things like yeah. that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I know what you mean. So yeah, the creature is um, a, a metaphorical representation of her condition, um, and it follows her around. It um, no one else can see the creature, um, mm. which I thought would be really interesting thing to play around with, mm. like that surrealist element. And, to, and um, all the different, like the tapestry of, of all the different things that she's experiencing. So yeah, so that's what the um, her character Olive is all about. Yeah. And because in the synopsis it says she unexpectedly finds herself struggling with mental illness. So this is something yeah. that just sort of. So this is it was a journey. Emerged. Yeah, like initially she was in denial about this condition oh. and she she was adamant to rid herself of this condition mm. so she went on this journey to rid herself she tried like you know this like holistic therapy of like yoga and stuff like that and you know maybe if i do this it'll be gone or um you know she tried all these different these different methods of trying to rid herself um at one stage she even tries to kill it you know and she 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 grabs a stick and stabs it um and the, this you know um, pastel blood which is actually paint mm. I wanted it to be paint to, mm. to make it surreal uh, it sort of seeps out of this creature and she thinks it's dead but it's not she can't rid herself so she goes on this journey of discovering that essentially she has to live with this condition it's not going away it's a part of her and that she has to learn how to accept it how to manage it and in a way at the end she comes to that acceptance mm. where mm. he the creature puts its hand on the bench and she puts her hand on top of the creature's hand and it's almost like her accepting okay I have this condition now and I have to I have to learn to live with it I, mm. I, because the struggle um, mm. the struggle of trying to resist it or try to deny it just makes it worse mm. so she goes on this journey of acceptance that this is a yeah. part of her and, and how will she you know but I wanted to show mental illness in in many different ways so mm. Yeah. Well, you're, you've you've written also here what is at the heart of the film, and in your words you've said, my aim is to break down some of the stigmas associated around mental conditions, so people suffering with these conditions don't feel isolated, and can communicate freely about their symptoms without judgment, and get the help and support they need to live their best life. So it's um, yeah, it's a movie with a message. That's mm. for sure. It's really important for me also as an educator um, to make these conversations around mental illness, normalise them so that people don't feel isolated, so they don't feel mm. like there's something wrong with them or mm. there's this stigma mm. associated because there are a lot of people in society struggling with mental illnesses, you know, more than we know. And, and mm. there's this real, um, I think there's a lot of fear around people talking about it openly because they feel they'll be dejected or rejected or um and one of my aims is to to normalize these conversations and to make people feel comfortable 
to talk about these and to not feel mm. rejected or mm. Mm. Um, and to get the help that they need because mm-hmm. a huge problem is that mm. people are suffering mm. in silence mm. um, and one of my aims of her creature was to br- to start these conversations about mental health and to to show that there are people that are struggling mm. um, and to show that mental illness um, you know you can you can get help you can it can become an easier thing to cope with or to deal with you can live you can live a great life and still have a condition um, with the help mm. uh, I, I, one of the things in her creature that I think was really interesting too is I, I did want to show the vicious element of, of that mental illness that <coughs> torturous aspect yeah um, and not that you know and there's so many it's so broad mental illness is so broad and there's so many different levels and types and yeah. um, uh, but you know with the creature it's unpredictable like for example it just grabs her and, and, and starts attacking her and then dunks her into this like water and mm. I wanted the water to be like red like dunked into red water to, to create that surrealist element yeah. where it's like it's it's not real it's all in her mind mm. but to also show that that struggle and and that that uh, that that real struggle with mental illness and that it, it can be a real torturous thing that people are having to mm. deal with on a daily basis and one of my aims is to to try to help people overcome that and in the end she does come to a place of acceptance therefore she can seek the help she needs mm-hmm. Um, yes, yeah, so interestingly, the the mental health um, theme runs through a few films, including yours and others in this program. Mm. Um, and uh, I did I shared with you that my mother suffered from schizophrenia mm-hmm. all her life. Yeah. Um, and I saw her go through constant doctor's appointments, constant medication. So I'm coming from a place where, you know, I grew up in the 70s and 80s when, you know, back in the day, people got shunned, Mm -hmm. you know. But um, I'm seeing mental illness on the streets of Perth all the time now. Absolutely, yeah. Because I do some work in Yagan Square and I start Mm -hmm. at 5, 6 in the morning. And there are are homeless people with clear, you know, schizophrenia Mm -hmm. just wandering around barefoot every day. You know, yeah, it's and then um, it's not until the commuters come out catching trains and buses mm. and crossing through Yagan Square that um, people fill the area and that. But they're still they just kind of they don't really blend in because they stick out. You mm, know, that's but, right. But everyone's just walking past them. No one's sort of you know. Yeah. I think there's a real. Um, I think we have to stop ignoring the issue. Oh, absolutely. And. And making the general public feel guilty about homeless, you know, people with mental d- disabilities. Mm. But you know, Perth is so rich. Mm. No one should be homeless. Yeah, there and, definitely needs to be more money and, going into into people that that need this help. You know, to get off the streets yeah. and to get the help that is required. Um, I've been documenting the homeless for a while. I'm making mm. a short film called Fallen Through the Cracks. Yeah. Because in my opinion and through my observations of this issue, um, you know, I, I think that things like, you know, race, sex, gender, all these things that people are making big deals of now are trivial because they overshadow the fact that really at the end of the day, you're either privileged, underprivileged, or you've fallen through the cracks. And if you're suffering with mental illness Mm -hmm. and you can't get a job and it's ruined your life, then the streets are the Mm -hmm. only place to go. And if you don't have that support, like, um, you know, some people don't have the family support or they don't have the support. So um, the only place they have, you know, could be the streets. Well, you know, Baz, Baz, what's his name, Semflis Mm. took over as mayor and and basically said he was going to fix the problem. He's done nothing. Mm. This is a recurring thing. Like we've Mm. always, I've lived in Perth all my life, I'm 53, and homelessness has just always been a thing. Mm. Um, It's disgusting, really. Yeah, and I think one of the key things as well is education around mental health. So I think that it needs to be a big part of the education system, which Mm. it it is. I mean, they're, Mm. they're, they're teaching it. 
Um, but I think also, you know, these conversations need to be normalized. And like when, you know, people do encounter somebody with a mental condition, mm. th there needs to be a lot of empathy around that situation because this is an involuntary condition. They can't help that. They can't help what's going on with them. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I, you know, I would really love for there to be more help for um, people suffering with these conditions through, you know, the health systems and things like that. Um, I think also, you know, it could be a case of people not suffering from mental illness mm. and then all of a sudden their lives are turned upside down yeah. and um, and they're experiencing trauma. Trauma, yeah, yeah. And so it kind of triggers it, yes. you know. So your environment Absolutely. and, you know, the people around you are really, you know, affect your life, you know. Mm. And um, I don't know, there's, I think there's a lot of ignorance, you know, but... Um, at the end of the day, like in this day and age, like no one should be homeless mm. and, and we should be caring for people like this and getting them off the street. Absolutely. You know, I live in Victoria Park and this council is completely and utterly in denial of its shortcomings. Mm. There are homeless begging people up and down Albany Highway every day. Um, there, there's a, a woman who camped out the front of a church down the road here. Mm -hmm. Why aren't they letting her in? <laughs> yeah. You know, there are people, literally homeless people, camping outside church doors and they're not letting them in. Mm. You know, there are beggars every day collecting, um, uh, begging on, the, on, on Shepparton Road right outside John Hughes's mini car, car yards. Yeah. And he could, he could change their lives in a second. Mm. There is this um, real entitlement, this mm -hmm. privilege, I think. I, I put it down to privilege. You know, people yeah. who don't have mental illness and don't have financial problems or aren't looking at homelessness don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So they don't. But they can contribute to solving the problem. Yes, to helping. This, this suburb is so rich. I mean, I've, I've dealt with the council and I've looked into funding and all that. There's a lot of money here. But it just goes to crap. Let's, yeah. let's keep thinking out of the box and still, instead of yeah, like, they need to people get into need a safe, to eat. They need to get to a safe place. They need a bed. Where they can get support. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And Beds and, and just, yeah. yeah, safe, especially women. Mm. Women on the streets. Yeah. I mean, I can, I've seen a lot of really desperate homeless people. Mm. And even if you didn't have mental illness before you, you unfortunately became homeless, mm. well, you're gonna now. Yeah, from all the trauma and... And, and think yeah. about also surviving. Yeah. You, you know... What that would do to your central nervous system, but having also, to always the, be on that fight and flight kind I've of. come so close to homelessness on the streets. Mm. Um, I've managed to uh, avoid it. Mm. But I consider myself a pretty resourceful person yeah um but some of the people i've met i speak to homeless people and they let me take their portraits and, yeah. and things like that yeah and um they they just some of them just seem like they just didn't have that 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 capability to to be to to, to get themselves out of this situation yes. you know yeah. but everyone's different um there's a guy down the road here red mm -hmm. he's an aussie mm -hmm. um and, uh, and he sits in the hot sun on the concrete, Yeah. you know, and I said to him the other day. So resilient, you know. Well, no, I said to him the other day, like, dude, there's a beautiful shady park just down the road. Yeah. Go hang out there. Uh, it's all right. I don't mind the hot concrete, you know. Yeah. And I'm like, that's, that's old school mentality. Mm -hmm. Like, you know. Um, tough. <laughs> yeah. Tough and resilient. Mm. That, but I've, you know, I've I've worked with all, all sorts of people, and I've come across that kind of mm. a. But that might be like the reason why you're in that situation, you know. Mm. Um, anyway, look, I, it's 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 really you could you could like I don't want to overanalyze things, but mm. at the end of the day, Perth has an amazing opportunity to end homelessness. Yeah, and it just doesn't. A lot of Australians are just very comfortable now, especially FIFOs. Mm. And now if you have all these opportunities in life, then mental illness isn't really going to encroach on you unless it's hereditary mm. or something like that. Um, but I think that 
housing people and getting them off the street isn't that hard to do. It's, it just really comes down to whether the government wants to do it or not, and obviously mm. they don't. It, it says a lot about our society, you know. Yeah, it's, mm. it is really concerning, and, um, you know, I feel really sad for, you know, um, anyone that's struggling and that's in that position because it's not an easy thing, and yeah. especially when there's no support. Do you know what I mean? Um, so I hope that more is done and that people don't turn a blind eye mm, um, mm. to the situation. And yeah, it is very evident that that a lot of um, you know people that are on the streets are suffering from mental illness. So um, well, yeah, yeah, they're walking around Yagan Square, and most of them are Aboriginal as well. And this is the other thing in my observation, making this uh, documenting this issue. Um, every every homeless person I've come across, are Australian or Indigenous. And, you know, I'm not seeing other races in homeless situations. I'm not seeing, you know, um, anyone else really, but sort of older Australian people and Indigenous. And they are, you know, they, they might be, but the people I'm taking portraits of and speaking to mm. um, are Australian, yeah. you know? So we're, we're literally d- sort well, it's of... It's good that you're doing a, um, a film Well, on, I'm, on I'm hoping it's going... To, yeah, well, like, like what you're yep. doing with Her Creature, mm. I think that making, you know, film can make a difference. Oh, absolutely. You know? And um, my, my intention is to, you know, send it when, I f- when I'm happy with it. It's just to send it out and go this is our this is where we live just to bring more awareness around the situation and and if anyone can help that's great you know Mm. um yeah yeah. well let's um yeah all we can do is try that's right yeah yeah okay well let's um let's dive into your methodology i'd I'd like to hear the details of how this film was put together yeah sure it was a bit of a um (laughs) a work in progress well let me read out the methodology (laughs) yeah and then we can go into it Mm mm-hmm Her Creature is a didactic story with its primary objective to educate and confront some of the stigmas associated with mental illness. Olive comes in and out of the surreal and the real world to show the illogical nature of her condition. The creature is a metaphorical representation of her condition. Our aim was to strip the creature of any human qualities so it would be evident to the audience that it is not real. We did this using VFX and low budget exploration using paints and special effects makeup. The actor also captured the nature of the creature brilliantly. Our team of creatives worked together to create a meaningful message about mental illness. Um, yeah, I, I think the actor who played the creature mm. was, was, was well cast. Yeah, Evan Williams, yep. Mm. He understood it, he understood the creature, he understood what direction we were giving him about that and the relationship with him and Olive. So yeah, my methodology, um, there's not a lot, it's not very dialogue heavy, it's, it's quite poetic in, um, in nature, so I use a lot of sort of like, um, uh, poetic language at, mixed with imagery and juxtaposition. Um, I'm I've always been a real lover of, of like um, kind of the surreal kind of world, so mixing the real and the and the unreal. Mm. So she goes in and out of those, you know, like she's in the dance studio and then she falls back into this meadow. Um, yeah, the dance studio scene yeah. literally breaks the the sort of monotony, or not the monotony, but yeah, breaks up the film. And puts it into a completely different sort of scale, but it's sort of it's it's more upbeat. It's an upbeat scene. Yeah, well, I wanted some tapestry well. in there yeah. as well. I wanted to show that you know um, mm. that she when she tries to sort of you know she's accepting the creature, so she dances with the creature and tries to have fun, and and then she's almost in this like I feel good, I'm feeling good. You know, the, the yoga's working, and mm. and she's kind of almost in this euphoric. Um, kind of state because she feels mm. like she's free of um, so she falls back into this meadow mm. um, so it's, it's showing these because I'm quite a um, visually aesthetic person I, I wanted to show this really beautiful meadow and and um, this this it was great timing because this beautiful butterfly just flew across the the, the, oh, um, nice. the camera as, as we were filming it um, so it was so cool 
Um, so yeah, so that sort of shows, and then you know she goes in, then she's in another location. So it's like um, you know it's not um, conventional in the sense that it's it's not necessarily linear, and it, it jumps from different locations, and the transition into different locations um, was quite experimental in a way. Um, There's a scene yeah. that that intrigued me when you're uh, is it, you're in a, a laneway corridor. or the corridor, yeah, and there's the creature, and you're you're doing some hand movements yeah. and and sort of banging on the wall. Yeah, uh, can you explain yeah, that? Yeah, that's scene? A, that's a really uh, pivotal scene to the story, in particularly her condition because she's suffering from OCD. So I wanted to show what OCD can be like. Mm. Um, so the creature, even even its language, it says stop, but it says it in a way that's not really familiar, like the tone of, of how it says it. And then it comes through and um, we wanted to show how OCD can be quite controlling. Um, mm. So it, mm. it controls her, it's saying to her she has to, to, to tap her hands this many times. She's mm. just stepped on something, she has mm. to look at that and then she has to put her hand on the wall. If her finger on the wall moves even slightly, she must do it again. So in OCD, there's like um, you know um, compulsions, and then they you know um, there's and then they have to, it's kind of almost like, like they have to do a certain compulsion in order to feel better. So mm. she was hitting her hand, and 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 then hit, the creature like nodded its head as in that is not up to scratch. You need to repeat. So again, I'm showing that oh. the the torturous element that OCD can have. Um, and we did because so, it's rep repetition, rep repetitive. And then Peter Renzolio, who who edited it, um, mm. you know, we we spoke about how we could show this in an, in an, using the technical techniques of that um, of re repeating it like, tch -tch, and then almost like an uncomfortable mm. uh, audio to show that she's kind of stuck in a moment and she can't move until she can um, yeah. does her compulsion to the creature's standard before she can move on yeah, and um yeah. and then and so we use yeah like zaps and the creature was zapping mm. in and out like the vfx artist robert o'neill he did it like so the creature is zapping in and out of um of visual um so it shows this really like chaotic kind of zapping mm. and then even with the edit the edit started getting faster as because with ocd as well uh in a heightened moment um the adrenaline pumps up so the fight and flight kicks in um and it's pivotal in the sense that at the end, she decides to not no longer listen to the creature. So she actually gives it a look like I'm done, mm, mm. which is showing her growth and how mm. she how she actually can be stronger than her condition. Mm, yeah. Mm. What does OCD stand for? Obsessive compulsive disorder. Okay. Yes. You know, like if you're feeling so when your like mental illness is being enhanced by stress shit and... that's going down in your life, mm -hmm. you know, if your life is smooth then, you know, it, the illness or the, you know, your, your brain works, functions better. If you have, you know, security in your life, if you have people that love you in your life, you know, if you have a have love in your life, mm -hmm. is, I think that is, that is pretty much the key to, to um, the cure. Yeah, and you know? stress and things like that can definitely heighten mental conditions, you know, can all, all certain triggers can make you just go bang. Um, but as you know, sometimes you can just be predisposed. Um, it can be hereditary. You know, it, it can come or trauma, like from a trauma can cause um, trauma. conditions yeah, and things I, like that. I, I was watching something on YouTube about trauma and it was interesting what they said about how there's a theory, they were theorizing about the the reason why we get over things yeah. is because we shed dead cells all the time and because of the trauma is embedded in DNA and after you know some time you know where they say like time heals all mm -hmm. it's because we shed our skin and we shed dna yeah that's interesting <laughs> and and the trauma yeah. in the dna is yeah. kind of just like you know, healing and yeah. shedding yeah um, yeah but um but look it, it's 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 really like an individual yeah thing it depends what kind of you know Mm. shit is going down yeah in your life absolutely you, there's sometimes where it's more heightened than other times i mean the, a really good thing though um in particular uh, like in regards to ocd is there is a lot of really successful treatments which is really good like i'm i'm actually doing a documentary on ocd as oh, well okay um so i've been talking to like one of the top uh clinical psychologists mm. in ocd and mm. i've been reading some books and there are a lot of really effective treatments um if done properly i mean it's hard like when you've got a mental condition, it's very hard to 
um, to be really consistent and strong with the treatment. But if you are, if you if you can manage to do the treatment, it can be very effective. Um, so that's really great to know that there is help and that that you know you can your condition actually can get a lot better um, with that support and tools that you know. Mm. The stigma of drugs, mm. you know, has to change because, I mean, you can go to the shops and buy a pack of cigarettes and a bottle of wine for five dollars and get loaded or as much as you like, mm. you know. Um, but things like marijuana and um, ecstasy uh, are, are sort of mind-altering mm-hmm. drugs, but they won't—they won't make you go berserk mm. like alcohol. You know. I guess it's all it's all dependent on the individual and what works it's, for them. Yeah. I, I mean, some people with mental conditions it can actually um, uh, be Everyone's really problematic. Different. You know, like um, you yeah. know, like um, you know, like for example, weed can be quite triggering for some people with schizophrenia. Not everybody, but um, there mm. are some some mm. drugs that can actually be can make it worse. But that, but I have heard that there are some people that they find some of these drugs very effective for their condition. So. It's really depends on the in, what works for the individual. It is. Everyone's got a different brain. Yeah, that's um, right. But I, I think there needs to be less conservatism when it comes to therapies mm-hmm. yep. and, and medications. Yeah. Um, and people with uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Yep. I mean, look, look, at, look at the evidence uh, um, that uh, cannabis oil literally cures people with uh, Parkinson's disease yeah, in minutes. It can be, I've heard it can be really effective. There's video evidence of it yeah, that I've watched. Absolutely. Uh, this man comes in like just completely shaking and everything, yeah. puts a couple of drops under his tongue. Next thing, he's just like totally calm. Yeah. And, you know, these things have been um, suppressed. Mm-hmm. This, this, this medication has been suppressed for a long time. Mm-hmm. I watched my mother gobble all sorts of, you know, she had a Webster pack mm-hmm. just Monday, Tuesday, Monday to Sunday for like full of pills. Yeah. Uh, and, um, you know, but the problem is I, I, we, I was a support worker for five years, so I had to administer Webster packs to people with disabilities as yeah. well. But I just started seeing all these like not so sort of crucial um, medication being, mm. and so I'm like, no, this is like over medicating for well, no over medica- and yeah. just like, oh, he needs more fiber in his diet. He has to take these now, like for clients. I'm like, how did how did you come to that conclusion first? And he's already got a fucking Webster pack, chockers. Mm. Like some of these little bulbs had too many pills in them. Wow, you know, yeah, that really has to be monitored. Doesn't well, it? I started opening my eyes in that yeah. industry and going, oh, well, the pharmaceutical industry loves the disability services agencies, you know, and but I just started seeing, like, you know, through my mum's mm. condition and then working with people uh, with mental disabilities and yeah. just how much medication they yeah. swallow every day. And I get it, yeah. but I think it's an overkill for that yep. for that industry. Mm-hmm. And then you've got you know you've got your support workers on the ground administering this stuff. Yeah. But then you've got all the desk job people ticking it all off. Yeah. And another thing I think that's really vital is making sure they get the proper diagnosis because some people are on the wrong meds. Well, and that could be even worse for them. You know what well, I mean? Yeah. Look, my mum got to a stage where she just you know had enough. Yeah. And she just stopped taking them. But yeah. Uh, she started hallucinating. People that don't, uh, you know, have to worry about any of this, mm. don't get it. Yeah. How it impacts your life, you know. Yeah. And for the carer as well, it really, carers, yeah. really can impact But we them. need better carers. Like in my, like, I, I was a support worker for five years. Yeah. And I concluded that I just had too much compassion for that job. Like I would walk into such dis functional situations yeah. in people's homes yeah. and they'd had care for years mm-hmm. I, I, I could really unpack about yeah. that industry and I, I resigned after five years um, yeah. and uh, and then that was just before the NDIS rolled out mm-hmm. but that whole thing needs to be just um, ended and re like people are taking advantage mm. Um, of just dis- people with disabilities yeah. and mental illness, and they're all um, they're just yeah they're just these, these people that don't suffer from it they mm. they totally I've never experienced I've never seen anyone suffer they're the from worst it. people yeah. I, I can't I can't even tell you I met like 
you know, the Centrelink put me on dis on disability payments because of anxiety, and I've got some physical injuries, mm -hmm. and I had to go through these um, disability employment agencies mm -hmm. to find work, and they did absolutely nothing mm -hmm. but keep you on their books, and. I met some of the most mind-bogglingly stupid people I've ever met who are getting paid very well with bonuses and everything to not do their jobs. Mm. It's a big scam. I don't know why the, the government's looking into the NDIS, but that is something they have to shut down straight away because they're not making people with disabilities any... They're not doing them any favours. Mm -hmm. They're cashing in on them. I was one of them. Oh, goodness. So try... You know, I was with that company for three years. Yeah. But if they had got me, you know, a job or something, you need purpose in life. Everyone needs a purpose. Yeah. And if you're without a house, without a family, living on the streets, you're going to die on the street. Yeah. Like, you gotta know, get, yeah, you've got to have purpose. You've got to have gotta a, purpose help them get a purpose or get, get them um, socializing with, you know, other people, like forming, dignity. forming you lo you lose a your community, groups. They lo they've lost their dignity. You yeah. know, especially the women. So, yeah, it's it's yeah. such a massive issue. You know, there's people struggling on the streets. Yeah, so. it's a yeah, it's a very sad situation and definitely something more needs to be done about it. Yeah. Well, we're trying at least. Yes, you know. that's right. Yeah, they're trying. All right. Well, let's talk about film again. Okay, cool. um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I want to know um, some of your influences um, growing up. Who were you influenced by growing up? And then you know we we tend to become more our influences become more obscure yes. later on in life. So yeah, well I've always actually been into unusual kind of I've always liked kind of um, you know absurdist kind of stuff. Um, you know even as a kid I, I I got into one of my my favorite movies was Labyrinth. So Jim Henson's oh, yeah. Labyrinth, and I loved the puppetry. I loved this like the real world and mm. I mean Bowie he's just an absolute legend um I, I would listen to his music and watch his stuff and like he was he is like um the making of the labyrinth is excellent there's a yeah they made a documentary when the film came yeah out and... or the puppetry I mean look at it, it's so revolutionary for its time mm. and you know I, I, I watched very uh, you know like I was really into Alice in Wonderland because you know she goes into this unusual world and um, I really loved the aspect, the absurdist aspect of, you know, innate objects coming alive and animals talking and mm. um, kind of out of the box kind of stuff. Yeah, um, animals wearing clothes. Yeah. Or like, in my case, like animals were always in bands growing up. Yeah. <laughs> like the banana splits. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's those, cool though. It's like, you know, yeah, I mean, all the cartoons. Personalities. Josie and the Pussycats, yeah. uh, Jabberjaw, like they're all in bands. Yeah. Well, I love <laughs> Archie. Archie. Yes, I love the young ones also growing oh, up. The, you know, totally the young ones. Rick Mayall, he's one of my favourite actors. But, you know, like how the p potatoes come alive in the oh, sink yeah, and they yeah. talk to them and shit. The cigarette <laughs> butts and the ashtray <laughs> talk. That has been... The young yes. ones inspired me mm. to, to, to look at... Um, you know, shooting film a little bit differently, but yeah, they would have like the main, the main sort of subjects, and then the camera would just zoom into yes. some hole in the wall where there's a rat talking to another rat or something, yes. or the two cigarette butts, or yeah, I um, uh, so Ben Elton, the the creator of the yep. Young Ones, the writer, mm -hmm. he's a uh, he he's like a um, he's involved, or he was involved with the. Um, Fairbridge Folk Festival in in um, in Perth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, the last time I went was a few years ago. It's no longer around. But um, I I didn't know he was going to be there. And oh, I wow. I went to the last act in the big yeah. tent, and it was Adrian Edmondson who yep. plays Vivian oh, in the young ones. Yeah, because he was in Bottom with Rick Mayall as well. Yeah, yeah. But he was on stage playing a mandolin with with a three three piece folk band covering punk songs. Oh wow. And yeah. I was like front right oh, up front legend. just doing Vivian Yes I know. <laughs> And he's on his mandolin and he's doing the cure and public oh, image limited and it was awesome. Oh, yeah. And uh, and Ben Elton walking around. Uh, All these English comedians I didn't get yeah. to meet them 
But I thought, man, you guys made an impact on our, oh, our generation. And they were bold and they took like big Hilarious risks too, yeah. And like just yeah. really out there. So yeah. another another influential sort of similarity would be Monty Python. Oh yes, Monty Python. Um, Python pushed the boundaries nice and like, very early in the in the seventies, yeah. you know. Um, actually one of the scenes from uh, Monty Python that really stuck with me, um, it was the existentialist theme with the the goldfish the or the fish in the tank oh yeah like the, morning, 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 morning 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 look morning. harold's being eaten yes so yeah. but but it's really interesting the meaning of life yes well this is the thing the meaning of life but it's really interesting because that's another one of my influences and something that was really interesting for me was like existentialism and absurdism and like you know you think oh what's the meaning of that these fish you know swimming around in this repetition repetitious way mm. but the meaning is that is that you've got to find meaning in life as in like you know so like with absurdism people think oh it makes no sense you know but actually it does make sense you're meant to be looking at the meaning if that makes any sense so it's not futile it's actually looking at at life and looking at what the meaning of life is yeah and, metaphors and yeah and like these repetitious acts that we do that we waste so much time in mm. you know why are we doing them like and you know it's all about sort of living those, your those, free life you know because the film starts with those Freedom. fish in the tank yeah and maybe those fish in the tank just represent the everyday person yeah and and swimming and around the same circles. time wasted in 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 sometimes futile routines yeah you know it's yeah. kind of looks, the workforce in, it looks yeah, at it looks yeah. at a lot of that too and about you know um really actually mm. um tapping into freedom and sort of and the very you know, uh T terry gillam's short film before the actual feature yeah the crimson permanent assurance company okay do you remember that, no. Is that it's his short film yeah and it's basically him taking the piss out of corporates the cor uh, corporations yes and and this uh, crimson permanent assurance that kind of fitting in <laughs> it with turns the it into a it turns it into yeah. a pirate movie basically yeah. and uh it's it's fantastic but it opens the film yeah i love um, absurdist work like yeah. some of the ideas in it are really interesting and and there's like um you know like um absurdist playwrights as well there's mm. that they look at a lot of like uh, devoid of like communication and language and that's why i love like some of the dialogues just really like wacky and out there makes no sense but it's actually drawing um, our focus into communication how we need to communicate more and how mm. sometimes mm. we we lack communication mm. so there is actually a lot of purpose and meaning behind existentialism and absurdism that people people just think what is this doesn't mean anything yeah. but actually look deeper it does yeah it's actually it, gr know. growing up as gen x uh, punk had a lot of influence on me. Yeah. And um, and the, the ethos, not mm. just the music, but I, I, I just agreed with the ethos. Mm. And it was a real working class sort of, you know, music. There was the, the DIY film age. But I, I think we grew up with really sort of, you know, groundbreaking, provocative stuff, especially yeah. 70s. Very bold and... Yeah, yeah anti-establishment, yeah. anti but, mm. um, but pro-equality. So trying to fight against the norm in a sense, you know, like as in, you know, um, questioning these societal But also bands and, like the Dead Kennedys mm. and especially Crass. There was an English mm. band called Crass. Their marketing was always sort of in your face about mm. war corruption you know mm -hmm. and um and they would have these really um you know shocking kind of imagery of mm. the realities of war mm -hmm. but people like conservative people would look at this and go oh it's violence why are they selling violence to mm. children you know al gore's wife um tried to boycott the dead kennedys in the mm. 80s and she knew nothing about this band. She mm. took she took the album covers and the music by face value, mm -hmm. and um, and and tried to um, you know boycott or, or sue the Dead Kennedys, and didn't uh, totally underestimated Jello Biafra's intelligence as mm. the singer of the band, mm -hmm. and he turned up to court mm -hmm. with an abundance of evidence against her, and she couldn't deny it, and he mm -hmm. won his case. Mm -hmm. But what happened was. She actually, um, she uh, managed to persuade the government. Do you remember back in the day, all these um, stickers on records and tapes and CDs that said like warning, mm -hmm. um, yep. 
um, the content. Or con, con, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, what, what did it say? Like, Can't it was, remember. Yeah, yeah. I know what you. I know what you mean, though. But you know, you know warning, warning. They're swearing on this album. Yes. Yeah. Warning. Someone said shit. Warning. Like explicit yeah, language or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that was because of her. Okay. Yeah. yeah well. Um, but it didn't stop anyone from buying records. Yeah. It actually promoted them more. Because like, oh, this, this one, how, I swear, it's yeah, Magic Dance Machine. The, it's got explicit language. Exactly. <laughs> the conservative mainstream media and will never um, understand that what they're doing is like they're, pr- they're promoting what they're trying <laughs> yeah, to stop. Yeah, especially you know? for the rebels. Exactly. Oh, it's got swearing. swearing in it. Great. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> then, uh, but then you had like mm. bands like you know um, NWA. Yeah. Really provocative. Yeah. I never got into that. I was more into punk. But yeah. when I when when NWA came out yeah. with their first album, I was like, what the? Yeah. <laughs> There's some shit on there that really, you know. Yeah, I really like um, music as well. I guess I'm a big, you know, I, I grew up with a lot of alternative music. So mm. like, you know, Veruca Salt. Oh, cool. Um, Portis Hedge. Um, Look, the 90s. The, the was, Cure. Was, the 90s was such a golden Radiohead. age. Radiohead. Independent yeah. film and music. Yeah. Tarantino came out in the 90s. Yeah. You know, well, Reservoir like, Dogs. Yeah. And Mike Patton in Faith No More. Oh. He's really experimental. I met Mike with Patton. His music. Oh, my God. I'm yeah. Joking. It's a great story, but... <laughs> Well, uh, I met Quentin Tarantino, but oh, we'll talk yeah, about yeah, that yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, um, yeah. Cool. So I think music is really influential in film as well because you, you have all these really alternative influences. And coming back to that topic about my influences, mm. so I think I'm influenced with film in that way too. I like to, to, to mm. try stuff a bit edgy or out of the box or yeah. a bit alternative, um, really thought provoking, but yep. in a way using like visual aesthetics and maybe not so dialogue heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I love all different types of genres of film um, yeah. making. Um, I appreciate them all, but yeah. But um, another, well, oh, there's a bit of a plane coming over there, you can hear it. Um, another one that, uh, another influence for me is, for me, is um, Noel Fielding, The Mighty Boosh. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So, The Mighty Boosh was like... That is the, really wacky the, and weird. The, the British like. comedy comeback we, we were waiting for. Yeah. Uh, like, since the since the young ones. Yeah. I think. Yeah, and that, I would put them uh, on the so same. They are so experimental, you know, they just try this really oh, weird yeah. stuff that, you know, and um, it's yeah. also really like, you know... Uh, if, if you didn't non-linear. grow up with BBC television... Yeah. Like, I, I, I think that growing up with the kind of TV I grew up with, um, which was all BBC. Yeah. So, you know, the goodies. Oh, yeah. Kenny goodies. Everett. Yeah. Doctor Who, you know. Yeah. The Tomorrow People. Like, you know, it goes on. Um, but the funny A thing is... A lot of it's really stemmed in comedy too, which is great. It's comedy, like, but also comedy. dark, dark yeah. humour. Yes. Sarcasm, yeah. cynicism. Like Rowan Atkinson kind of... You know, yeah, no, like not the nine Adam. o'clock news. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. we grew up with all of that stuff, mm. and I think it rubbed off on me because I was only a kid when all that stuff. Yeah, was big. yeah. But the the thing that I found out later, Bill Oddy from the Goodies was on Triple J many years ago. Yeah. when he was in Australia, and he was talking about the fact that these shows, the Goodies, Doctor Who, Kenny Everett, especially in 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 England in the UK, they were all late night adult TV shows, mm-hmm. but in Australia. They were on right after school. I know, during the day. <laughs> so we, we used to run I used to run home for the Kenny Everett video show. And yeah. then like you then you like you're watching hot gossip, you yeah. know, or the, the sexy yeah. dances. Oh gosh. And um and you know there's something quite different about Kenny, but you're not too sure what it is. <laughs> Uh, but then he comes out in drag and you know. Um <laughs> but all those yeah. all those shows I think I think it requires a particular type of humor too. I don't think everyone is not everyone's jam. No, you know what I mean. No, well, um, yeah. I, Mike's partner is American, mm. and um, you know when we got together, we we sort of sat in front of the TV and and, and shared each other's TV shows, yeah. favorite T shirt, yeah, yeah. shows growing up, and um, I don't think Americans can get uh, English humor. Like to a degree, I think they 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 kind of they get Monty Python, mm. but you know she just did not get 
the mighty boosh. Mm. Yeah, uh, some people are just like, what was that? Yeah, but like, yeah. <laughs> it's great. Or, um, <laughs> or other things. But then the stuff that she showed me was like pretty fucking violent. Yeah. <laughs> and and like, and I didn't find it very funny at yeah. all. I remember being shown uh, this t- an animated TV show called Super Jail. Okay. Yeah. Really full on. But I, I've always loved animation and TV animation, but I think American television animation mm-hmm. post The Simpsons has now got this really super fast pace to it. Mm-hmm. The dialogue's really fast, the jokes are in and out, and like, yeah. and, and for me, I'm, it's just a bit too much for me. So I don't watch Rick and Morty. Yeah. I, I like it, but it's just... Every too, second is yeah. an epic fucking thing going on, and but, yeah, yeah, it's just this pace. It's, mm. it's a really quick pace. But if you watch, um, you know, British classic sort of British television, mm-hmm. there's just a, a flow to it that I'm used to, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, but yeah, we we grew up in times where television, film, and music was pushing boundaries, you know. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and I I love that aspect of pushing boundaries, and like mm. with the films that I like d- doing as well. I, I think. It's nice to push the boundaries, do stuff outside of the box, just be really creative. And I think absolutely being yeah. experimental is great because you have that freedom to explore mm. without feeling like it, you know, it has to be a certain way or you kind of just expressing it's art, essentially. Yes. Um, that's, that's exactly yeah. what I'm pr- promoting yeah. uh, in this gig. It's just just make art, make good art. And trying stuff that, you know? that's true to like your creative soul as in mm. what do you think would be interesting here and not feeling influenced by anyone else or just doing what what you feel as a creative artist would work and being true to your own vision is really i think really vital in creating mm, mm. In creating work mm. and um experimentation yeah. for me i mean the last some of the stuff i've been making lately mm. is purely just a simple tiny little idea mm-hmm. that you just develop and develop and develop until it turns into something and you've, mm. you've kind of finished it, you know? Mm. Um, that's, that's kind of how it's, you know, sparked me off onto finding this little gap in the market, mm. experimental And film, trying, taking know? those risks, being bold. You know, if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Take the risk. And, and yeah. you know, and also yeah. I, I think not being too concerned about what other people, are, if other people are going to like it or not, I think that's really important. Like... If you know what I mean, like, yeah, I do. I think uh, we, especially we can be in this swayed day and sometime age. By, by that, and I think it's important to, to keep true to your own creative yeah. vision and ideas. There's a there's a difference I find now compared to then, where um, now I, you you kind of because of attitudes of today, and I'm not saying like that you should put inappropriate things out on mm. in, in art or whatever. Mm. But even now, because of people's sensitivities, you have to kind of think a little bit differently. Mm. But then if we go making everything absolutely fucking safe, Mm. then we're not going to learn anything. Mm. You know, uh, a healthy dose of conflict in your life isn't a bad thing. That's actually why we are actually, we we all have anxiety genes. Mm. Yeah. There's because, you know, at one point in time, humans were running away from tigers and you know, yes uh, like pr- that, that they, they, they were preyed upon fight or flight fight or flight Actually, that or, or me. war other tribe warring tribes you know i am um, the opening um <clears throat> sequence of um space odyssey 2001 oh yeah Kubrick, yeah that that was really interesting mm. like, i watched that um well yeah this morning and uh, yeah you can see that there is meaning in it. Like some people might look at it and go, what the fuck was that? But it's actually really interesting. The, you know, the dawn, it, yeah, it's called the dawn of man. Yeah. And, and, and it is totally experimental because, you know, um, working just with sound and, and, and those sounds are quite abrupt, but they're meant to be like the, mm. the, the, the monkeys kind of making these really primal kind mm. of screeches, but it, it there's meaning behind that. What is it saying about, yeah. you know... That that scene, I think, mm. is trying to depict the missing link, mm. you know, from when, uh, you know, people were, were apes to them building uh, infrastructure mm. and like, just that spark of intelligence. Mm. And so Kubrick put it in a, in a movie basically saying that it was, you know, otherworldly... Um, in, um, it was prompted by other otherworldly sort of uh, mm. influences, and that scene where like the black monolith is just yeah. in the ground. Their physical reaction to the object, yeah, yeah. is again really also, interesting. You don't need any dialogue; mm, it's mm. just 
yeah curiosity though yeah you know the curiosity that hu- part of the human condition where yeah we, and as soon yeah. as as soon as as soon as he touches the monolith he gains knowledge mm. you know and also it could also represent overcoming fear mm. of the unknown because what if we don't know things you know we're, we're scared yes. of what we don't know oh absolutely that, that was very yeah anxiety is the biggest bitch for that yeah anxiety is a lie uncertainty well anxiety people... will tell you that there's everything to be worried about oh yeah it's a big lie <laughs> it's a big lie and um and and until you kind of face that that mm. fear and 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 overcome it that's right then you that's have the confidence to do yeah to do other... and you're right about that that thing that that appeared in that in that the film monolith. They, they were very curious and it's it's something very it was very foreign to them they're like what is this and and they're trying to they're trying to gauge it and i think that was a really good investigation on just like the human condition and how when something new comes into the space how that yeah that curiosity the of, reluctance or yeah um well yeah i mean but it's so so once you know he go, he gains the knowledge yeah and then the evolution literally begins with um you know defending their territory from the other tribe yeah so it's like that that key component survival isn't it survival really and also he, he makes of... the first weapon mm. that kills the animal and yeah then so there's he, so much meaning it, behind you know? the film it's really interesting mm. i'm i'm gonna watch it in its entirety soon but yeah yeah but that, uh, that yeah. film uh stayed with me um, I I saw it when I was like six or seven. I remember you said in the cinema. Yeah, I went. I walked. Yeah. My, my mate, my mate's mum dropped us off at Inaloo Twin Cinema to see. I think a Disney movie. Yeah. At the time, and we walked into the other cinema and we sat through Stanley Kubrick's 2001: A Space yeah. Odyssey, and that film just stayed with me forever. Mm. I watched it. You know, then it, later on it came out on video, and I just watched it over and over again. And then some point in time, uh, it got it got re-released. The the thirty five mil prints mm. were remastered, and I went to Luna to see it in, in its entirety, including the um, the original intermission, because mm-hmm. it was still in the days where people had to go out and smoke, and then come back. <laughs> come back. That was a while ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. smoking was like okay, yeah. you know, a priority. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a totally, not only is it a groundbreaking film visually, it laid the foundations for, for brand new um, methodology in filmmaking. And, yes. Uh, he built infrastructure that's yes. you know, amazing. Yeah, because yeah. I think there should be a lot of free, freedom and creative expression in filmmaking. It's such a great medium. And I think, um, you know, you should be able to explore in any way that you want to. Um, and using different styles, different techniques, different methodologies. Mm, mm. And everyone has their own unique style of how they do things. Mm, mm. Um, and, you know, I really love the symbolism aspect too, like things or the juxtaposition, like things representing things. Mm. It forces the audience to really think and it be subjective. Like mm, you shouldn't mm. have to spell everything out to your audience. You know, your audience should have an experience where they interpret it how they what works for them yeah you know what i mean yeah but yeah but with the film i think it's it, i think experimental film is great because it gives audience a different experience mm. um as mm. well um mm. you know and i really do like these quite unconventional films and mm. films that have meaning though I, lo- I like the ones that have a have a meaning and and it makes the audience really think hard about what is the meaning here mm. and you know and impacts them and hopefully mm brings about mm. change or mm. um, makes them view things differently. And like I said, I'm, the education aspect I think is really vital. What's the best film you've seen lately? Oh gosh, what a question. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this, is, this, this might be a bit controversial, but I really liked Poor Things. Oh, I haven't um, seen that. Is it Yogoslandismos? I can't, I can't, I'm not sure how to say the director's name. Brilliant director. Okay. Um, but it, it is very, it's it's quite controversial, as in mm. it's very different. Um, and I absolutely love Emma Stone's work, the actor, because I'm, I love, oh, she's, I love acting. Yeah, she's she was good brilliant. in Birdman. Oh, Birdman. Oh, Birdman was great. Yes, yeah. love it. And she was actually a brilliant Cruella as well. Oh, um, okay. But... 
But yeah, I really like Poor Things because I think it really did test the boundaries and I think they explored with some really different um, ways of shooting it and filming it and the dialogue and the panning in, panning out the colours. Okay. Even the acting style was very different and there were some shocking elements in there too. But again, it's all it all has meaning behind it. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. But I think th- that movie is one of the is I think one where people either like it or they don't. Mm. But I mm. um yeah, I really enjoyed it. I thought it was very different and interesting. So um also an actor that I'm really uh, love her work is um, Tilda Swinton. Uh, she also um, I watched this short film recently called All Kinds of Love, which is an experimental film. It's really interesting. So it's quite poetic. And um, at one stage, she's sitting and eating a flower. It's, yeah, it's, it really moved me. I thought it was really, really fascinating. Yeah, you sent me that film and I watched it and she's perfect for it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. She she's, has got this androgynous look about her and she can do like old world periodic pieces very well. Yes, her look is very diverse. And um, yeah, she's just really captivating to watch. And I really love that she's very open. She, she tries new stuff. So she, she actually does quite a lot of experimental work. Mm, yeah. Um, well, and I... art as well, like she, as in um, dresses up, um, it, you know, like wearable art and things like that. Yeah. yeah. Orlando is definitely her, mm. um, her first film, which is just, yeah, she's a bit of a time lord in that film. She lives throughout the decades mm. and never ages, but she just transitions into, she starts as a man and becomes a woman. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah, it's a pretty cool film. Well, I think overall we just need more groundbreaking, provocative, boundary pushing films yes, out there. Taking you know? those risks and and experimenting and um all for the love of storytelling you know um and yeah these visual aesthetics are really important too like making it a real um enjoyable experience for the audience that makes them think outside the box and maybe something they haven't experienced before i think is really cool you can't really def- define experimental film because it, it has that element of freedom boundless yeah you know? which i love as well yeah, yeah. it's not conformed by anything you know i wanted to get away like experimental film for me over the over the years has always had this stigma of it being you know um the the sound level was has to be like burstingly loud yeah. or high frequencies and yeah uh, i remember going to see experimental film showcases where the, the frequencies were so high they'll pierce and everybody was like <laughs> in pain you know yes, yeah. i want to get away from that old school avant-garde yeah. sort of or, stigma yeah or anyone sort of stereotyping the genre because it's 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 so broad that you can't put but it into a real category putting really. a noise kind of soundtrack to 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 film or to mm. video it's I, I don't know like I, I i i'm all for experimentation when it comes to soundtracking mm. and things like that but just noise can just be a lazy yeah sort of, yeah yeah if you, know, you, want, if you want it to be an enjoyable experience for the well, audience. you don't the thing is you don't want it to be an endurance yes um, or uncomfortable or like, yeah ugh, there like was there was an entry or... uh it, it, it didn't make it but there was an entry that um, was proposed where it was it was five minutes of one of these sort of experimental films that just um, are just sort of you know edited very harshly and repetitive mm. and uh, and after five minutes it's becoming an endurance you mm. know yeah you, you kind of like oh cringy as, as I'm not if you cut it down to a minute I'll screen it because otherwise five minutes I might clear the it might clear the room man mm. you know. That's right. I think that some filmmakers need to just um, be experimental, but don't make it an endurance. Yes. Don't make it that it's just so like harshly repetitive or it sounds, um, you know, abrasive. Yes, I know exactly what you mean. You know, that, yeah. that's that's just um, that's just a that's just noise. Yes, I know, know what you mean, and, and it's and yeah, it makes it unenjo- unenjoyable for the audience, and the, the audience are there because they, you know, they. They want to be enjoyed. They want to be entertained. They want to be moved. Mm. They want to be captivated. Yeah, uh, they yeah. don't want to be like cringing in their seat. <laughs> yeah, but you can be unconventional and, oh, not, yeah. and not be, you know, annoying. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You can be unconventional and be annoying. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, it's um, 
it's super cool. And I mean, look, I, I personally, I've always loved film. I've always had an infatuation with it and, mm. and, and acting and filmmaking and mm. writing and telling stories. So, um, yeah, I'm just so excited that I get to be a part of this festival as mm. well. And mm. um, I want to yeah. also push people to do um, not like unconventional, so um, displaying out of the cinema, mm. you know, installations or you know projections and mm. you know maybe next time i'll put something i'll put a call out for installation oh work. yeah i love installation stuff yeah yeah stuff so like, like that. outside of yeah doing um performance mm. art even is really cool because you know um that's really awesome yeah, as well yeah. but you know like performance art can be an installation because you can incorporate performance within an installation yeah yeah um yeah so yeah, yeah. i've done it a few times <laughs> oh yeah i love it yeah cool yeah cool um yeah so just yeah pushing boundaries breaking yes. ground things like that being so brave just taking be, be brave taking risks, yeah being yeah. true to your who you are as a creative and not being swayed by other people's influences mm. like i mean obviously it's great to get um feedback and and people can be really influential in a really positive way but to always stay true to your creative vision as well yeah 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 expression through art can be the purest form of well um therapy in a way oh absolutely you know therapy through art um i did a lot of writing mm. uh, when i was going through a tough time and just wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote mm. and it's wrote. a form of expression and, and it, it can be very healing and therapeutic you know if you expressing yourself through story cathartic cathartic C cathartic cathartic That's yeah it can be uh, quite cathartic yeah what well, i i yeah. if people sort of uh you know tell me they've you know been going through hard times and all this stuff i just yeah. always encourage them to write about it yeah write absolutely. the story write it down you don't have to be a writer you can just you know it, you've got you know whatever works for you i think for creatives uh, often uh, it's a great outlet like whether they dance or play mm. music or write a film or, or act mm. um it's a really great form of mm. self-expression and yeah. um can, and you, you can know, like for me yeah, really writing helpful. like i went way back into my childhood and mm. you know after my my mum passed and i just wrote about my life yeah and it gave me the opportunity to actually connect the dots yes you know, and you've got it there in black and white in your own A real own healing words. process, and you processing can put it, it all. You can put it away and mm. then come back to it later. But I think for me, it was a way of just connecting the dots throughout my life. Yeah. And, and how things affected yeah, me. Yeah, and really processing because you're writing it, you're processing what's going on. And, you know, hopefully, you know, and healing through that process and understanding it more. Do you know what I mean? I, I think that's, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it was the most effective therapy for me. Mm. Um, just, yeah, and, and coming to a conclusion, you know. And, yeah. And once you come to a conclusion about your trauma or your, or your past, you, um, it's easier to, to, to handle. Yes. Because you're not questioning things. You Once know. you start to get to a healing process where you understand yeah. them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I was just looking at this quote. Um, it was oh, really yeah. interesting, Vincent van Gogh. I was, and, oh, yeah. Um, it says, I'm just having a look, hold on. Um, Art is to console those who are broken in life. So that's really interesting, oh, Vincent van Gogh. Yes. Art is there to console those van who are broken Gogh. in life. So that's really interesting, I think, you know, that art can be absolutely used to, to help people heal or to process stuff going on in their life Absolutely. that be through filmmaking or yeah. theater or acting or dance yeah. or music um well look art yeah. painting you know yeah. look at salvador dali he's a classic oh, experimentalist um surrealist artist yeah yeah um, absolutely. yeah surrealist yeah to the to the core yes um oh yeah this there's another quote that i love i love the quoting um yeah oh hold on yes it's um uh, take your broken heart and turn it into art oh I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as a as a songwriter, you know, I've written broken hearted songs. <laughs> yeah. Lots of them. Yeah. Love songs. Uh, th I wouldn't say that, you know, they're, they're the easiest things to write, but they mm. kind of are because it's all emotional. You know? Yeah. It depends on the song, you know, but like Paul McCartney's song, mm. Silly Love Songs, you know, he wrote that because of someone said to him why are you always writing silly love songs and he's like 
because it's a love song. Oh, right? it's such a art is such a beautiful way of expressing your emotions, your feelings, mm, mm. processing stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's there are some um, artists that d- do do that shock value kind of thing, to, but again, it still has meaning behind it. You know, it, it does. Um, part of part of the sort of my submission policy is to not send anything grotesque or yeah. or like overly or, yeah, yeah or or you know just don't 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 go too far yes yeah i agree you know yeah absolutely because um, that's um i don't know that doesn't belong in this particular but i just mm. never really want to deal with it you know yeah <laughs> uh i used to i used Fair to run enough. horror film festivals yeah and um it was in collaboration with another, with a, with the original kind of directors of the festival. So they always had a say in mm. what what went. And um, the opening night, the first film, I forget what it was called, but basically it was this, it's this like very very clever ex, uh, special effects movie horror film mm. of one man and a Stanley Trimmer, <laughs> and he he literally like skins himself alive. Oh my god! I know. It, Far out. That's brutal. It is brutal, and um, uh, I held a before before the film started. I, I uh, organised a zombie walk. Yeah. In Leaderville at night. Yeah. It was. It's the best one that's ever been. Yeah. Cool. No one else has done it. it better than me. Love it. I would have been a zombie <laughs> up there. And anyway, there was um, there was a, a significant amount of like tourists and Japanese people. And these two uh, Japanese girls um, sat right at the front and the movie started and they fucking freaked. Oh, they no. freaked out and ran out screaming oh, wow. of the cinema. Yeah. I mean, it, it is pretty full on. It is pretty full on, you know. Yeah. But after doing after doing those, I did about four, was it four yeah, years. Yeah, you just realise that's, that's not your jam. That's not what, yeah. There were, there were people... I started like there were, there were some films that I didn't really want to screen, but I had to compromise because mm. of the, the partnership. Mm. And there was some pretty full on violent, not so much violent, but psychologically fucked up films. Mm. There was a film called Mum and Dad, and it mm. was based on the, the that couple in England that that were serial killers, mm. uh, Rose and Fred, Fred and Rose West. Oh yeah, and it was based on that. And I must say, like as a production and the acting like everything was really top about that film but the content was just i couldn't sit through it yeah you know but uh at the end of that film i remember some young people coming out of the audience uh, out of the cinema and, mm. and were like very elated by what they saw and were kind of the, it wasn't the reaction i expected mm. it was an opposite reaction and it made me made me think what the fuck am i doing you know, like I'm kind of promoting, you know, fucked up yeah, concepts. Yeah, made you go, I'm not going to promote this shit anymore. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and uh, and that was the last one I did. And um, yeah. But I I think um, I always, there's a, back in the day, you know, video, right? Yeah, and some people get into that genre and, you know, but, whatever. But back but in the day, I don't like it. exploitation went to video back in the day. Mm. You had, you know... There were, you know, all these genres, mm. but you had horror and then you had terror. Wow. And so horror was fear of the unknown, like, you know, ghosts, monsters, mm-hmm. things like that. Mm-hmm. And terror is psychological, mm. you know, psychos, yeah. killers, slashes and things yeah, like that. Wow. And then somehow over time, terror became horror. Mm. And now horror is considered both Genres. Yeah, they're, they're merged together. But yeah, I, I distinctly remember VHS covers having the word horror and the word terror on them, which separated them. Yeah. But then slasher films somehow became part of the horror. Mm. I don't. I, I I think they're two totally different genres. Genres, yeah. You know, one of them is a crazy motherfucker running after you after uh, to kill you. Yeah. And the other one is the supernatural that you can't do very much about. Mm. You know. Poltergeist is a horror film, mm-hmm. uh, but Texas Chainsaw Massacre mm-hmm. is a is a psychological is a slasher film. Yeah, you know? but that film for many years was always considered the the best horror film ever made. Yeah, there's not a drop of blood in it. 
Yeah. You don't see anyone being killed. It's, it's just more psychological. It's psychological. Yeah. It's uh, it's you know, Leatherface is a fucked up character. Yeah. The whole family's fucked up, you know. Yeah. Um, and um, and you don't actually see anyone being. It's not a gross movie. It's just yeah. a disturbing film. Yeah. You know, but it was always considered this iconic, the best horror film. You know, mm-hmm. Evil Evil Dead. Mm. You yeah. know. Yeah. Uh, if you watch Evil Dead now, the scenes where the, the the demons are dying and they're decomposing, it's stop motion. It's yeah. it's, it's 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 like they're melting yeah. plasticine. Yes, yeah. It's, it, I remember over, parts of yeah, that movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But um, but you know Alfred Hitchcock um, would always just use uh, you know so they're all psycho- psychological. Psychological. Yeah. Mm. Um, and the. I think we, we grew up in times where you didn't see the killing, mm. but you you knew it was going to happen, and that was enough. more effective. Yeah, it's more effective when you when it's more simulated. psychological. Yeah, when it's yeah, the yeah. violence was simulated. Yeah, except for cowboy and Indian films. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. are a bit different. John Wayne, you know. Yeah, fucking John Wayne. Let's not talk about him. <laughs> But um, anyway, I think cool. we've covered quite a yes, lot. Yes, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's no been worries. awesome. Been a hoot. Yes. Mm. So um, your creature, your creature. That's all right. Her creature. <laughs> so her creature is featuring at Experimental Film this weekend at the back lot, four o'clock. Get your tickets and we'll see you there. Yes, we will see you there. Looking forward to it. Bye for now. Ciao.